Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. Lots to talk about today. We'll discuss the England-Sri Lanka white ball series, the first ODI between the England and India women's sides, the latest action from the blast. We'll look ahead to the crucial round of the county championship that starts on Sunday and the 100 wildcard draft. I'm Yaz Rana and this morning I'm joined by former England batsman Mark Butcher, Wisdom.com features editor Tar Hashim and the editor-in-chief of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker. Um, thankfully, no pre-show ad reads today. Uh, we'll, we're, we're recording this week's show from the wonderful Sixes Cricket Club uh, in central London. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a very cool bar slash restaurant with interactive cricket nets. Um, we, we tried it out last week. Tyler. It was quite, quite good fun. Yeah. Um, some some better, better, better than others. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was definitely by, by some distance the worst. Uh, but it's <laughs> very, very good there's, fun. There's a lovely impressionistic portrait of Sachin Tendulkar pointing his yes, yes. MRF bat at me just yeah. over Mark Butcher's shoulder quite just surreal. by one of the nets <laughs> quite surreal it is mildly surreal it's impressive though well since we last recorded England have wrapped up the T20i series against Sri Lanka 3-0 and they're 1-0 up in the ODI series um, to say that the wheels have fallen off for Sri Lanka I think would be a bit of an understatement uh, Kusal Mendis Nirishan Dikwela and Danushka Gunathalaka were suspended pending an inquiry uh, and sent home after the trio broke biosecure protocols before the start of the ODI series. Um, but it's just not been vintage cricket, has it? Um, you know, with, with the exception of the, maybe the first half of the run chase and the second T20I and maybe 10 minutes yesterday, it's not really been a moment no, where you'd say it's even been even. No, it hasn't. Um, and Sri Lanka are sort of veering from one catastrophe to the next. Um, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough during the, the lockdown um, post Christmas, just in the new year, to be there for the two test matches that England played um, back in January. And, you know, Joe Root played magnificently well, but but Sri Lanka was so comfortably outplayed in their own conditions, in Gaul of all places, um, as to sort of you, you worrying about their their, their welfare as a, as a cricketing nation. Um, and of course, on the road, that's only going to be exacerbated. They've also got problems as well in terms of discipline and, and player behaviour, which normally only comes when the wheels are off anyway. Um, you know, you can bl- look at the individuals and kind of blame them for their behaviour being out late at night, breaking curfew, breaking um, bubble protocols and all the rest of it. But that sort of stuff is always more likely when the team you're playing for is either poorly led, um, poor, uh, poorly paid, um, all of the other poorlies that you could possibly come up with for Sri Lanka at the moment. So, I mean, you know, two one-day internationals left. And barring a piece of individual brilliance, which we know Sri Lanka um, are capable of, um, sort of Cusel Pereira springs to mind, um, you cannot see how they're going to be England in either of them. You really can't, unless England just decide not to turn up themselves for one of them. Because mm. it's... Um, Yep, it's it's a, it's sad to see. It's sad to see how sort of the mighty have fallen in terms of Sri Lanka in the last five or six years. Yeah, Phil. Before we get into England, not that long ago, Sri Lanka would have come to England on a white ball tour and been overwhelming favourites six, seven years ago. Even, um, do you think this is just a cyclical thing? Just this current crop of players just not quite at that level, um, or, or, or do you see the, the shoot to the side that that could progress? In there? I mean, Hasaranga had a, a very good T Twenty I series, and I kind of think with the batsmen. You can see there's talent there, but like none of them have just like quite kicked on, particularly in white ball cricket, to the level you kind of need. I, truth be told, I don't feel fully qualified to answer that question regarding the, the infrastructural issues. I mean, I know the headline stuff, as we all do. Uh, we can all obviously identify the loss of a handful of legends, but we can also identify um, one of those legends in Jaya Surya being banned for two years for admitting corruption and that uh, sense of there being a a corrupt core in the coaching structure at that time with Zoiza, the bowling coach, also going down as well. So something is rotten in the in the state there and, and there's no question of that. Um, now, I'm not saying for a second that the current setup bears any of those hallmarks, but it does filter down that sense of of what was once this kind of collective that was overachieving and producing vibrant cricket over and above its its means and its resources. Uh, you're not getting that sense at the moment, um, and as Mark says, you know these these three lads who went out on on the on the razzle in Durham, um, it's probably indicative of a of a sort of team culture that is not especially unified at the minute, and that you know that does happen. There's more chance that these boys are gonna gonna behave like that if they're feeling like they're not really 
it's not a cohesive whole. So there are some still some young talents coming through. You know, Nisanka made that brilliant hundred on on debut. He's the lad who averages something like sixty seven in first class cricket. And so you will still get these talents coming through. Um, but will you get these real legacy talents? These kind of unusual cricketers, these these iconic cricketers. From a small island without much money and without much backing, I don't know. I don't know. You, you feel like the, what happened with the West Indies when they overachieved for decades versus their means. Possibly there's a similar kind of pattern now emerging with Sri Lankan cricket. Um, but as I say, I don't know for sure. You know, we should mm. get Fidel Fernando yeah. on the show, get Andrew on. You know, yeah. he'll, he'll tell us what for. Yeah, I, I, it's a very sad story, though. Yeah, specifically with white ball cricket, you kind of look at all the it's like top eight teams in the world. All of them pretty much have like two or three guys in the top six who average like 45 in ODI cricket. You know, in the same way that we've been saying that the standard of test match bowling is very high at the moment, I think that the standard of white ball batting is very high. And Sri Lanka just, just don't quite have... Pereira kind of threatened to play one of those innings yesterday, but you just kind of feel they don't, don't have... If they're two or three bats and away from being actually on the right side, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it was an innings where it was like everything's going against me right now. I'm just going to go for it. I mean, I, I know Pereira is a, an attacking player to, to begin with, but it was, that, that was a sense you got and it was, everything was kind of riding on him. And, and Captain, once, keeper, opening batsman, yeah, yeah. only in fourth player, <laughs> only bloke who's even turned up on time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think only boat with an international hundred in the team as well. Oh god, yeah. So it, it, it did have a have a sense of carrying your bat, didn't it? Yeah. At one point yesterday, I think there's been nine players in ODIs who have carried their bat, yeah. and when it, including when was, the gaffer. Yeah, yeah. I, I gathered, <laughs> yes, I forgot about that. Yeah. West Indies 2000. And when he was out for what 70 something on, yeah. it was kind of like, all right, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Now we now we move. Before we get to England, it's a word on a couple of the other Shrank and bowlers. Like I think we, you know, maybe being a bit harsh on Shrank, they are missing. Uh, not just the, the band trio, but they're missing a few other uh, batsmen out injured. But the bowling attacks actually looked quite threatening and has threatened England at various points already this series. Yeah, yeah. A couple of couple of beanpole quicks who, with real pace. You know, Kamira in particular was hitting 89s, 88s, 89s quite regularly yesterday. Um, and so, as I say, you will still get these talents. You will still get these talents come through. Um, the left arm spinner as well, and the, you know, the test match bowler, um, M. Baldinia, he's class as well. Uh, and he... You feel like he's the kind of cricketer that can do it elsewhere as well as just in Sri Lanka. So, look, there will still be players. There will still be players to watch. Um, but there's a hell of a long way to go before, you, before they can really find themselves back on that top table again, where they have been, let's be fair, for a long, long time. Mm, absolutely. Um, so, our, on, from an English perspective, not long to go until the T20 World Cup. Did England learn anything from that series? I, I don't think so. Not really. Because the thing is, you see guys come back like... Um, Wokes and Willie, but who haven't played T20, T20 eyes for a long time. But I mean, like we know what they can do. Chris Wokes playing after six years and you know bowling really well. That's not that's not really a surprise. I think the one the one box that maybe you could say they ticked was with Livingston in that second T20 eye where it was kind of it was almost like a nice you know practice situation where you're you've lost a few wickets up top and you you got to, you know manage a chase now and Livingston Livingston does it pretty well with with Billings alongside him which you know just shows England England's depth but oh, I can't really say you learn much I mean you know it was I tell, I did, I tell you one thing you did learn is that the idea that Josh Butler categorically because of his record has to open the batting for England in the T20s is an utter load of nonsense isn't it <laughs> because anyone any of them could do it David Milan gets a chance to do it he makes runs it isn't you know, that that whole argument based around, well, yeah, but look at how many, what his strike rate is and what he averages when he opens. The argument is never whether or not he's any good at opening. The argument is whether or not he's in the best place for England to win the tournament opening. And that's that's the question. I kind so, of feel and, that. And that hasn't been answered yet either, to I, my satisfaction. I feel sorry, that, sorry, that, that no, train has passed, don't you think? That like We talked a lot about this last year when it seemed like England didn't know what they wanted to do, but it does just look like England have put all their, you know, all their money on Butler opening. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that... that that's, I, I get your point, but I think England will just still, it's, it's nailed on, isn't it? Like yeah. they're not, they're yeah. not I, I, but, I, but, but I'm not what I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that one, one question that was answered was that if Josh Butler doesn't open, is it going to be a disaster for England? No, it's not yeah. because, because any one of the yeah, others can do it too. All of them that's, that's the point, I think. I, I, t I totally see that. I mean, he's obviously our best finisher. He's also probably by a nose, the best batsman in the, in the first six. So... <laughs> So do you take a bob each way? Do you, do you go on the old, the old principle that your best players need to face as many deliveries as possible in 120-ball game of cricket? 
you, you can you can spin it different ways. Personally, come the really really big games, I like to see him go out there. I remember the the eighty odd he got against Australia, maybe two years ago or maybe last, last year. year yeah. Was it last yeah, year? Yeah, yeah. And 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 England finished up sort of four or five down that day, and and it was a f- last over finish. But he was in complete control from the start, and th- that was a good seam attack he faced. And he was twenty four off twenty five initially, and then once he was in, then he then he went then he yeah. got going. But you know, Mark's right. I mean, you know, you can pay him at five, and you can trust it will finish the game in the last six as well. So it's tricky. And um, just on Milan, who's you know another seventy ball forty five uh, forty ball forty five ball seventy five. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Freudian right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know, I had to Italy answer. Raj, you were talking about. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, 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 and had to answer questions again about his strike rate from you know upstart journalists like yourself and Taha and all the rest what? of them. <laughs> it just seems like everyone's always constantly getting at, at this fella, and yeah. and he sometimes doesn't do himself any favors because he's he's a bit ham fisted in how he answers certain questions. He's not a particularly clubbable kind of cricketer. Um, he's had one or two run-ins off, off the pitch as well with the media and so on. Um, he doesn't do himself any favours. And I can, I can understand the discussion, but it's like you just set your watch by it. You set your watch by it. 24 hours before Milan gets a 45 ball 70, there will be a whole tranche of stuff online talking about well, how he's a waste of space and this isn't his <laughs> right format. And he can play any other game except T20, the one that he just happens to be the number one ranked yeah. batsman in the world. And I know that's slightly I, skewed. I know it's skewed, but even so. No, no, I've got, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> I've got... A, I've got a lot of respect for the sort of inevitability of David Milan, where <laughs> yeah. you've got a couple That'd of low a good scores. Name for a story, the inevitability yeah, you got, you of got, David Milan. You've got a couple of low scores. You know the strike rate's not looking good, and then so you know he just kind of pulls off that that one innings where you're like, fair enough, and then you look at his overall record and you're like, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah I, I I do think though the discussion about Milan before this game was or this series was different to the discussions about Milan previously. I think before it was very much, he's doing really well, uh, but we will, we have Joe Root out the side uh, and he does start quite slowly. Whereas, the, whereas this discussion was actually, he was just out of nick. He hadn't got many runs across quite a few different competitions. Uh, he barely got a run in the blast. So that he had actually gone had, like a little he period. He had made two almost double centuries in the championship for That's Yorkshire, true. So That's true. In T20, right. in T20, T20 cricket, though, right. he's, yeah, You kids just love to get the knives out, <laughs> don't you? You can hear it in the press box. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was talking about, well, I think I even mentioned him as somebody that could, that could very easily slot back into England's top three if, if, the, if the current mob... Yeah continue to uh, make such a quite a hash of it so yeah I don't know the circumstances around the reason why he had to leave the one day squad for personal reasons um, but just on a cricketing level you know it's a blow for him because I think he would have probably played yesterday I think he might have played in, on the, th- the game on Thursday when this show will probably be coming out uh, yeah and a lot of people say 50 overs might be his might be the the, the most perfect for him in that he can start on his own terms and then ex- expand as he, as he tends to do. Um, definitely, he's an enigma in English cricket, Milan, but the story's not over and, and uh, yeah, he's got runs in Australia, as we know. We'll come back come down, down at that conversation again down the line, but I'd be very surprised if he's not in that 17 come the end of the summer. I think one of the most interesting things from this series was, was something that happened off the field. It was um, after the series, Owen Morgan name-checking Tamar Mills as someone as being uh, still on England's radar, despite not having played for England for, for over four years now. Um, I asked at the five, five or so minutes ago, have England learned anything? And one thing they definitely didn't learn is who their death bowlers are. Um, partly because they weren't really needed to bowl the death in this series. Uh, Chris <laughs> Jordan's had a tough time of it for England recently, as has Tom Curran. Those are two guys who have done a lot of death bowling. One of the things that's held Chris Wokes back in his T20 career has been death bowling. Joffre Archer, obviously brilliant at basically everything he does with a white ball, but if you had to pick one weakness, it would be death bowling. Um, so there is still that gap in in the in the setup. But do, do you think Mills will, will come in? Well, I, it was you're right. I, it, it did make me arch an eyebrow um, to hear Owen Morgan say something like that, and he he doesn't waste his words, Owen. So that was calculated, I'm sure. And that means that he's thinking about it, and it means that in in much the same way that Joffre Archer was able to come in at the last minute to a, a settled 50-over squad and knock out the likes of, um, of Willie um, before the 50-over the World Cup, that, that that could very easily happen before the T- T20 World Cup. And I like that about Morgan. He's, just, he's not sentimental. He's looking at it. He's saying, we've got a tournament to win. The only thing that matters is the trophy. And, um, and if I think we need a 90-mile-an-hour um, 
slower ball slinging left arm beast, then I'm going to have him. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, so I, I quite, I think it's a very clever thing to do to uh, let Mills know that he's being thought of and looked at, encourage him to, um, to try and stay fit if he can and, and to keep the performances up. And there's every chance he'll be on the plane. Because, you know, Tom, Tom Curran, Sam Curran, um, Chris Jordan, you know, CJ's kind of like a, is, is a, is a, is a must pick or is an, is, he's the first name on the team sheet, it would appear. But you can't help but th- thinking, crikey, his numbers have been, have, have, have not been great for quite some time. And, and the one thing about Chris Jordan is this, is that he will, he will win you probably what, one out of five at the end. You know what I mean? He does that, the impossible, where he's defense seven or something, and suddenly you've won the game, or he'll come in and do something like that. But then the rest of the time, he's kind of, anonymous isn't the right word, but it's kind of, oh, anybody could have done that. Mm. Um, so, you know, he, he, is, he is not, he is not as, as reliable, or as, he's not infallible enough to be the one specialist death bowler that England have. Mm. Tom Curran has had his problems too, and they're very similar in terms of pace and, and approach at the end. So it would probably be rather rather useful, particularly given Joffre's um, predicament with injury and stuff at the moment, to have a proper, a genuine, genuinely quick, unpleasant angle, excellent slow bowl, bowling um, specialist in Mills waiting in the wing. Can, can I ask you a totally incongruous question? Um, when you were playing, were you, were you ever intimidated to the extent that it got inside your head. Because with Mills, you're talking extreme pace. Was there ever, an, ever a time? I, I, can only remember, I can only remember once, and it was very brief. It was facing Mornay Morkel for the first time right. in a T20 game at Beckenham in the dark. Mm. And, we, and we needed, you know, needed 11s or something, and, he, and everything was at my neck. And I'm kind of thinking, well, I'm not seeing this particularly good. It's very, very fast. And I'm going to have to hook it. And it's probably going to tear my head off. And I was thinking, this is not fun. <laughs> so that was about the, uh, about the only time. But uh, um, uh, as much because of the fact that you have, you know, if, if it had been a, it'd been a test match or something where you could bob and weave and, and wait for him to tire himself out, no problem. But you had, you had to score at 12. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that made it very unpleasant yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah. Morning, Morkel running in at yeah, you in the, in dark. the dark. I think that answers <laughs> I mean, every question. That would have been, been what, 2000, 2006, 2007, something like that. So he was young and very fast. Yes, back then. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't yeah. sound fun. No. Um, so how, how concerned do you think England should be about Owen Morgan's form? Is it one of those talking points you only really have when there aren't that many talking points? Um, I mean, he, he hasn't passed 30 in 14 games. Yeah, but I think... Um, kind of looking at the stats yesterday I mean part of that is to do with him he had this exceptional run basically after the 2019 World Cup in T20 internationals where you know he was striking at close to 190 averaging more than 50 um, and that was a four and basically with I know Bairstow taking that four position and England kind of needing to solve that finisher role he's dropped down and yeah he's, he's definitely struggling but I mean that's that's going to happen when you're in that role um, I mean what I mean, are you asking? Is there is there pressure on his place? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. more, more in terms of like, he's obviously he's obviously going to play. That's not that's not the question. But it's just like that, he's, he's going to end up at, at five or six, isn't he? Yeah. When when England are back at full strength, that's where where he'll end up, um, and he will take on the responsibility himself as being the as mm. being the finisher. But it's I mean, I'm not. So- I'm, I'm, I'm I completely ignore what Owen Morgan does most of the time. <laughs> And until you get to, to series yeah. and things that matter. Exactly. He's been doing it f- for so long. It's just kind of like, just don't worry about it. He's, he's in that team at the moment to suss out where all the rest of the pieces fit around him. And then he'll kind of, he'll concentrate on himself when he, get, when he gets to that point, I should think. And he's a guy who's gone through some serious lean patches before. Exactly, I mean, yeah. I remember, you know, before the, basically before that 2015 World Cup where he was really struggling and he, and he obviously struggled through that World Cup. But then, you know, when he kick-started the whole new, you know, white ball revolution, whatever, um, he, he was the guy who did it. You know, he was he was brilliant that, that series against New Zealand, basically that summer. Um, so he, he kind of, he has, he has this way of, of finding it when he, when he needs to, you know. Um, and so it's too old it's, to waste energy. Yeah. And that's what he is. Yeah. He's conserving until, yeah. it, until it's important. And you never look at Owen Morgan and kind of feel worried about him because he's like... Icy cool. He, yeah. It's like, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. Yeah, that's that's reassuring. Um, Tar, <laughs> what, what's your what's your moment of the week? 
Um, mine was watching Chris Wokes yesterday when he was, you know, kind of unplayable maiden, wicked maidens, whatever. And he was creeping up on a on a potential five foot. And then I'm just like, oh, I'll, I'll have a look at his numbers. And he's in yesterday he went past 150 ODR wickets. And then I was like, oh, he's got. I remembered, oh yeah, he's got two six footers in ODR cricket. You know, he could get get another one today. And then you think, and then you look, and the only people with more ODR wickets for England are Anderson, Goff, Broad, Flintoff, and and Rashid. Um, he's got a better average than Broad and Rashid. He's got more fifers than all of them. And then suddenly I'm kind of thinking, oh God, he's Chris Wakes, England's <laughs> greatest ever ODI bowler. <laughs> and it's just, it's just a thought that crept on me because it's like Chris Wakes, I mean, it's almost cliche to say he's just like this super nice guy, but it's also kind of true. And then you don't associate that with greatness in a way. We know Chris Wokes is an exceptional bowler, but we kind of forget it sometimes as well. Um, and then I thought, you know, Three for in that well, World Cup semi final. You don't play for a year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> three had, to, had to be rested off his three overs yeah. as well. Three, three for in the, <laughs> the semi final of that 2019 World Cup. Three for in the final that everyone kind of forgets as well, I guess. Um, and, and then the argument mounts. Um, and then you look at his stats with the bat as well. And he's just been such a good cricketer. And then, you know, part of me also, we, we've talked about this for quite a few years where it's like, you know, if there wasn't Broader Anderson, Wokes would have played this many tests, taking this many wickets. And you actually see that in, in the ODI format where after that World Cup of 2015, Anderson Broad dropped out, Wokes became the attack leader and he's been phenomenal ever since. And so you wonder what would have happened if the same thing would have happened in test cricket. We'll find but, we're going to find out in Australia. <laughs> yeah, but we've, we've, uh, we've seen it. We've seen it in ODIs and, and it's, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it just crept on me that I thought yesterday and I think it's a strong argument to make actually yeah 100% with that new ball he is just he's just so good he, yeah. he kind of bowls like exactly. a, almost like a test match opening bowler yeah like, pretty ge much genuine yeah. wicket taker not go for much run hits mm. a hard length mm. I, th I think he's one of the, the greatest sportsmen in Britain is this um, because you played him in snooker but football, <laughs> football he, snooker? He, was, he was on he what? was on Villa's books as well um, brilliant golfer Snooker might have mentioned that before. Batter three um, World but, Cup. but his skill, le his skill level <laughs> across the board, across the three formats as well, is outstanding. C especially as the white ball doesn't swing for more than five minutes. He said that he said this to me. He said if if you can get two overs of actual swing with the white ball, then it's a result. But after that, straight away you're, you're cutting it. You're, it's out the back of the hand. You're holding it. You're using the crease, etc., etc., etc. His skill levels are superb. His action is immaculate. Um, he's very, very rarely injured because everything goes through straight. Technically very sound with the bat, all the rest of it. I mean, there was even pe people kind of getting wild about him batting at three for England. Do you remember that in Test cricket when there was no one who could do it? <laughs> and they're looking around and says, oh, he, he can play straight, he'll do it. But, but it does sort of tap into this kind of, this, this Wokesian thing about him being kind of an immaculate cricket. But sometimes that, you, you end up taking that for granted because everything looks just so. And there's no kind of danger there. But the numbers are beginning to, to, to creep up. Um, is, is, he, is, he, is he one of England's greats? No. Is, is, is he one of the key people that got that World Cup over the line? Absolutely. You know, that, that semi-final belonged to Wokes. That opening spell against India in the group stages in a, in a must-win belonged to Wokes. Um, he, he will go to Australia this, this winter... And he, he may well struggle on those kinds of un merciless pitches because he's not got that absolute pace. And he doesn't have that particular height. Um, but that's not to say that he doesn't have an immense leg legacy that he's left on English cricket over the last 10 years. Um, another player that we maybe take for granted a bit, Joe Root, is creeping up on a very special record. Yeah, 70-odd shy yeah. of becoming England's all-time cross-format batsman. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, and he's, what, 32? No, just 30. 30. Yeah, he's just 30. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where, where do you start? Uh, firstly, he, wants, he, he expected to have had a lot more. <laughs> yeah. um, he's riled that he doesn't play T20 cricket and mentions it every single week, whenever he's asked. He plays every game available for Yorkshire in T20 yeah. cricket as well, just to keep making this point. So he, for, for his money, he should have a lot more. He should also, whisper it, have more in Test cricket as well. And... Yeah, we've spoken about this before and, and how long do we keep going before it has to become a, a proper significant conversation about his, his form at home in particular against Seam. Seam. All of that said, uh, 
he's he's the most graceful player that I've I've seen play for England um, in of out of this era, uh, and he's combined that kind of cussedness, that technical excellence with style and grace as well, and the impudence of the early years as well. I mean, you'd you'd want to watch him, you know, with with Cookie, bless him. If you if you missed the first half hour of, of the morning, it didn't matter too much. <laughs> Whereas with Root, it's in that golden period, that mid middle part of the last decade, that 2015 era when he was just untouchable as a as a Test match batsman, and as a one day batsman, as a 50 over player, he's he's, he's an astonishing player because you can just hang everything around him. Um, in that uh, in that middle period, he was just a dream, a celestial player, and and. Is there going to be a third, fourth act in Joe's yes. batting career? Yes, yeah. there is. Now, you, you believe that and you hope that, uh, and by no means am I questioning that, but it's, it's due, isn't it? It's, it's now. It's two huge series coming up, and it's, he's played 10 test matches in Australia, and he's not made 100, and he's, he's struggled. Well, he's not struggled. He was actually great Some last time Some people made out. two. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just peel one off at, at Brisbane, do they? Um... <laughs> <laughs> so you know, loads of cliches around it about how it's a pivotal time for for him, but it really is for him because he won't get too many more tours out to Australia, and that is so much of, of how you measure yourself. Uh, I was out there last time. We all saw what it was like for him. You know, he was on a drip come the end of it in in, in Sydney, and and he he will go back uh, more determined than ever before to, to finally make his mark. Um, in England, he's, he's got an excellent Ashes record. In Australia, he's got a poor one. It really is now uh, for him to really nail down all of those, all of those uh, hopes and dreams that we've always put on him. He's already eight-year-old runs away from, from being untouchable. But the question is, can he be one of the all-time greats? One of the all-timers. And that's what's up for grabs for him. Mm, absolutely. Um, Butch, you you were in Bristol for the first women's ODI this week. England won that very, very comfortably. Runs for Beaumont. Let's give a very straightforward run chase. Um, Beaumont's records, record recently is amazing. I think she's got a 15 every time she's batted in ODI cricket this year. Number one in the world. Yeah, I think she's just, yeah, she's just had four. She's got four on the bounce at the moment. Yeah. Joining the likes of, I think, Jan Britton, et cetera, et cetera on that. Only Charlotte Edwards has done it five on the trot. Mm. And six on the trot, I think, in consecutive uh, runs. So yeah, I mean, she she looks a, she's a very very good player, mm. very very good, um, and has a has a game for for pretty much everything. Um, Nat Siver, obviously, terrific cricketer, and um, you know she's she could become one of the one of the best to do it. You know, she's been hot on the heels of somebody like Elise Perry. Perhaps hasn't quite got the skill with the ball, but with the bat, she could. Um, and that, well, I mean, the disappointing thing for, for me about the whole thing was that England sort of were very, very good indeed, extremely competent in all areas and, and, and excellent in some others. But that India going into the series, the sort of all the, t- the chat had been around, um, you know, their scoring rates, their kind of, you know, the, their ability to post scores, the fact that their sort of average score at, at, is around about the 210 mark in 50 over cricket. And that the basic reason for that is that they've got, some terrific ball strikers, some terrific players in Smithy Mandana and um, Shafali Verma, obviously the, the, the new youngster on the block, Deep D. Sharma, Jamima Rodriguez, who doesn't even get into the side at the moment. And in the middle of that, they've got the, the highest scoring um, run, the highest run scorer in women's one day international cricket in Mitali Raj, most caps, who at, in the last 10, 11 games has averaged 50. 430 runs, averaging 50, but a strike rate of 63. Mm. Right? And not, this was before, this is before a ball had been bowled in the game. England win the toss, stick India in. India two for 20 in fourth or fifth over or something. So not, not a terrific start, but not a crisis. And <laughs> the captain walks to the crease and plays lots and lots of beautiful drives to extra cover for no run, mid-off and mid-on to n- for no run. Has no hustle, no uh, no sort of thought about trying to trying to put a little bit of pressure back on England through the entire innings. She she bats all the way through until there are about four overs left, makes seventy and average, uh, a strike rate of sixty, and they get two hundred and one for eight and lose the game and with it, fifteen it, overs to spare. And as you call on commentary as well, quite early on, it was an absolute road. It was, it was a really good pitch. It was a really good pitch. Is, so, is this they, an attitude thing, 
or is it that she well, can I, no longer change gears? Or no, she- listen, I, I, I interviewed her at the end, and she, and she put the defeat down to the bowlers not bowling the right sort of line and length, to which my, my eyebrows arched once more, and then to the fact that, that, that none of the other batters could, um, you know, could, could stay with her and you know, were, were good enough to do anything, to which my eyebrows jumped up to the back of my head. Um, I said, well, well, do you not think that the, sort of the strike rate might be something of an issue posting totals? Oh, no, well, maybe we'll look at that. Maybe we'll look at some of the other players and who we can bring in. I was thinking, I don't think, I'm talking about yeah. you. <laughs> but she doesn't see it. Well, one thing she does not see it, that, that perhaps her approach or what she is doing is kind of putting a handbrake on, on the younger and sort of more vivacious stroke players around her. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, I honestly think, and this is probably sacrilegious to the to those um, Indian fans um, who revere her. That they will be a better side when she's no longer in it. That's that's my my view. You know? What well, one thing that was was quite interesting was they didn't lose those two early wickets at the same time. So they they were twenty four for one, I think, in the fifth mm-hmm. over. Then Rout came at three. She was like one off twenty mm-hmm. when Mandana gets out, and suddenly they've gone from twenty four for nothing in the fifth over to twenty eight for two after 10 overs yeah. I kind of wonder if like that kind of uh, that negativity is um, contagious almost when you get one person coming out blocking it so it takes all the sting out of that actually quite good start absolutely and you know so Kate Cross and so the England's change bowlers I think um, Catherine Brunt decided that she was going to run up and try, you know put put two fielders back on the leg side and was going to bowl short to Verma which which worked um uh, Shrub Soul bowled, bowled as, as she does. She ended up knocking over Mandana uh, with a, with one that didn't swing massively away from her and she gave herself a bit of room. But then Kate Cross came in and bowled as like a seven-over spell for nothing. Ran up, bowled line and length to keep her up. And they literally just kept patting her straight back down the pitch without trying to do anything. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. But I think if, if, if from the top... If you're sort of, you know, your most senior player, the person that, that if you were expecting somebody to come out and kind of dominate proceedings and, and, and have a bit of presence and kind of go, right, well, I'm the boss out here. I've done this a thousand times. Watch me. If the boss comes out and does and plays it like that, then why should anybody else do any different? We'll all try an average 50 with a strike rate of 60. Thanks very much. We might not win very many games, but some, some of us will make a lot of runs. You know, it's just I hope that the, the game's on today, isn't it? It's Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday now, and when this will go out. So we'll see if um, if any of that criticism has kind of snuck through um, with India in the in the uh, in the match today. I hope it has. Yeah, I because th- I think. But the, the most annoying thing about it is, is we're not talking about a team that can't take care of itself. That it doesn't have players who are not capable of going out and playing like Tammy Beaumont and Nat Siver and giving it a good a good bang and really kind of giving a a positive account for themselves. Um, that's why you know somebody like Shafali Verma has, has become you know somebody that somebody that everybody's excited to see. They've got three or four players who are capable of playing like that, yeah. but none of them want to. And, and England will back themselves, kind of like however well you bowl to get a t- total of three hundred on a good pitch as well. Like that that method of playing, you're just not going to get your results sure. against yeah. teams like this. I mean, they, they, and their results are bad as well. Very they, very deep. Yeah, and uh, and they will try. You know, England are kind of taking it on board because they think the team we have to beat if we're going to win World Cups is going to be Australia. Australia are going to make two fifty scores plus. Um, more often than not. And so if we're going to hang with them, if we're going to have to turn them over in a semi-final or a final, we're going to have to be able to do that ourselves. And so that's that's why they're doing it. I mean, India at the moment are, are sort of hoping that they might squeak out of a group stage playing the way that they're playing. They're not going to win it playing like that. Yeah, and so close to winning it in 2017, lost this game, uh, lost at home to South Africa recently as well. Yeah, not, time, not yeah. Well, and the, and the World Cup's just sneaking up on us. It's, mm. you know, what, what are we, January, February... Um, 2022 in New Zealand yeah, and the, you know pitches in New Zealand are going to be good for, for stroke play um, so come on mm. come on <laughs> um, before we continue the rest of the show a plug for the for the Wisdom Summer Party Pack um, you can save 100 quid with our special bundle offer where you get 10 cans of our afternoon session pale ale and 10 cans of our little Wonder Amber Ale, you get six Wisdom Tang cards and a complete set of 48 Wisdom Cricket of the Year beer mats, each with a, with a little profile on, on each of them. It's kind of like perfect barbecue kit, isn't it? Everyone gets their own tank card, enough beer for everyone. You save 100 quid with that, so check out wisdom.com forward slash shop to get one of those. Um, the blast has been roaring on. Glamorgan beat Surrey by one run last night. You might have missed it. Um, they, they were today. Why um, might we have missed it? <laughs> some football thing happening somewhere. Um, we're standing uh, a late 
burst of fireworks from Carl Jameson, who's, who hit a 15 ball 31 in vain. Um, Stevie Eskenazki is, is in great form at the moment. Middlesex, he's hit scores of 102 not out, 64 and 91 not out in his last three games. Yeah, I saw um, that game against Essex when he got 100, got a brilliant 100. I was watching it on the stream. Yeah. Uh, and Essex somehow managed to win it with the four of the last over in the end. But, but having cruised it, then lost it, then cruised it, then lost it and all of that. But to see the Middlesex boys at the end of it and... They, they won actually the game after, but they were absolutely crushed. And there's sometimes that sense that the circus rolls on and another, another day, another game, and you forget about it, you know, and so on. No, 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 no. those boys were really, really, really crushed by that. And, and you know, when you're, when you're on, a, on a losing streak, it, it, it's hellish, you know, and you said it can be contagious how, how it affects everybody. You know, this is what you saw with, with Middlesex last week. So fair play to them. Getting getting over the line the, the, the game after and Eskenazi is a good player. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hard competition to kind of bounce back from a couple of like it's just relentless because there's a game every other day. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, had had six home games in twelve days. That's it's just ridiculous. home games. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, some guy called Ben Stokes he took a four for for, for Durham against Birmingham. There's a century for Alex Hales as um, not as good form continue their second in the North Group at the moment. Um, Tom Banton is back in the run. He's yes. called a rapid. 77 and then hit an unbeaten uh, 47 ball 100 um, a couple of days ago. But that was your, your moment of the week. Well, I mean, the, that game was moment of the week. The whole, it was one of those afternoons that I will remember for a long time. Um, not because of Tom Banton's extraordinary um, assault on the uh, the poor Kent bowlers. Um, Darren Stevens, that's how you play Darren Stevens, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just get, get down on one with, knee. Get him over my wicket for six, get him out of there. Um, but for, the, but for, for playing in conditions that I've never seen before. I've seen it at, at, in short periods of time at Hove when the when the fret rolls in up so off, it, the, it, off, the, uh, off the beach. Describe them. Well, it was, just, it was just like playing in a pea super. I was expecting <laughs> the phantom raspberry blower of old London town to pop out of an alleyway. Um, you know, there, it was just extremely extraordinary sort of thick um wet heavy air that you know that you could barely see through for most of um uh, kent's batting innings um and and yeah but banton was was stunning um we, <laughs> lewis gregory bowled very very smartly um protecting a, a short boundary to pick up four for um and somerset looked look really really good i mean they've kind of just got themselves up into the reckoning now um in terms of qualification it's going to be very very tight i think in the uh, in the South group to uh, the finish. Um, but my, my moment of the week, Banton, yeah, brilliant, great great to watch, um, was uh, Nick Knight attempting to do a demo in the uh, in the, the moments between the two innings in the changeover <laughs> to try and illustrate just how, how difficult it was to see out in the ground. So um, he, he'd managed to get hold of a bat. I think Lydia Greenway had a bat in the boot of her car and the cars were all parked up behind where we were in the pod. So that was all there. So you got all the cameras and the lights out and everything mm. like this. And Knighty is trying to is trying to, I don't know what, he must have had a, a clip-on microphone or something. But three times he tried to hit a catch, you know, like a little <laughs> skyer, um, one-handed to Simon Dahl, right? Dawley of no legs, no, no knees. He's had knee replacements, can't move. So Knighty goes, plink, hits this thing. It must have gone up about 15 feet in the air and dropped over the boundary, right? So that's take one. So everyone's kind of like, oh, God, what are we doing here? So he tries it again. This one goes 20 feet in the air and again plops over the boundary, nowhere near where Simon Dahl is. And so he has another go. He's just thinking, now is the time to quit, Knighty. He has another go, hits it, hits it off the inside edge this time. It goes <laughs> in the other direction, 30 yards away from Simon Dahl, who just kind of stands around and goes, mate, Give it away. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our half-time rap done. Yeah. So we were back back out on the field it, to watch Bands and Smash It. That's all on video? I think, yeah, we should have that. I mean, it was so <laughs> bad that it might not even make the bloopers. Okay, really? Yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, you that was put, my you, moment you, of the week. You need to put some pressure on the relevant people to, yeah, get, that, get, that out, to yeah. get that out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, el elsewhere, Yorkshire, at the top of the North group, they scored 226 against North Hans. Um, half century for Mark Stoneman, who's mm. on loan there from Surrey. And... Um, Jordan Thompson scored a 35 ball 74. I think we'll, we'll probably talk about him later in the show, but he's enjoying an a, a incredible season, um, particularly in the white ball stuff. Um, Ben's not here to explain this one, so I'll have to explain it for him. Um, we got we had one of those games where the DLS kind of loophole was was, was in play uh, the, the other day in the game between Sussex and Surrey. So basically, Sussex's run chase was interrupted after 4.5 overs. You need five overs for result. Um but Sussex were well ahead of both the DLS pass score and what the adjusted five-over target would have been 
had there been a revised target set. So they were 43 for one in pursuit of 176. Had the umpires decided that a game could, a final game could be finished, there'd have been a readjusted target of 39, which is obviously less than 43. Um, and Sussex wouldn't have required to face another ball, but there was no play possible, so the match was abandoned. Um, they, uh, this is so this, they, they had already overtaken already won, the, they, the five yeah. over mark that yeah. was required to win the game. Yeah, but that final delivery could not be bowled because it was raining. Yeah. Yeah, but no, but it was it was in the beautiful middle point where if the umpires had said earlier we got enough for a five-zero game, their target would have just been thirty-nine, so they would have already won. Sure, sure. Um, oh my word! Um, but <laughs> and apparently it, it had rained pretty much throughout the throughout the game. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have a listen. The Sussex were robbed. I, yeah. uh, no, I've, there's no, there's no no two ways about it by the sounds of things. So we were lucky to squeak away with it a point. But I do I do have an issue. With the ruling whereby once once one team has managed to get through twenty overs, that all the chasing team has to do is is to beat the target over five. I mean, if you think about what constitutes a game in a in a fifty over contest, you have to get twenty overs in, right? Twenty overs being what two fifths of of, mm-hmm. of the innings. Whereas this is a whereas quarter. this is a quarter, it kind of it's it. It's not enough for me. I I, I think, and yeah, I, I think, I think you fair, should. Actually. It that should be fair. adjusted that that if if only in the in the case where the, the team batting first has batted the entire twenty overs, mm-hmm. that you should need to bat half. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think that's it. I think that's to, point. For it to constitute yeah. a game, um, so up until that point, it doesn't matter. But once you've got ten, then all I of a sudden the DLS kicks in because you heard, I don't, don't see. I I don't think it's very fair. Um, which is not to say that Surrey should have, shouldn't have got away with with not losing the game yeah. the other night, given the yeah. rules as they were. You're, you're but I don't about think something that, else. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that the rules as they are are, are are very good. Yeah, no, I think that's completely valid. I mean, on on the DLS thing, it's worth clarifying. Like, it is a loophole, but it does happen. Uh, last season, this happened in a Kent Blast game. Um, it also happened with Australian and Champions Trophy um, in a game that basically cost them their spot in the tournament. Um, and Messrs Duckworth and Lewis themselves have, have said that, that the ICC are not implementing their own thing properly. Right. So um, change it. <laughs> so you can imagine what was going on in the dressing room, and you can imagine the Surrey lads as well, yeah. just sort of quickly just back getting all this stuff. Kit. Yeah, leg it, Stuart, leg it back to Stuart London. Nothing to do with there. us. Yeah. Pretty quick, don't you? Worry Nothing about to that. do with us. Yeah, Luke White posted mm. um, a, a GIF. On, on Twitter that suggested that he he wasn't ha- he wasn't happy. Um, I spoke to someone at Kent when exactly the same thing happened to them last season, and they said not only were they not happy, but they were actually speaking to the ECB to try and get them to change it as well. Right. Like I'm, I'm sure, obviously, sorry, don't mind it after this game, but surely every county would rather that. that and, uh, yeah, absolutely. Played. I mean, also, in the, so because sorry. there's 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 a contingency for for what happened. We all know what happens or the adjustment that's made. If, if the innings, if the first innings doesn't get completed, you know, you, you then make the adjustment and everybody knows where they stand. Um, everyone knows where they stand. Hopefully, by the time you've, you've resumed the next innings, you know how many you've got to get and you know what the amount of overs is. But in the, in the event that you think, you imagine, having got through 20 overs, that it's going to be a 20 over run chase, you can't then, to start and then realise three and a half overs in, oh my goodness, we're not going to get them all in, we just need to get five in. That's, I mean, the, the, the fielding side generally has no price, yeah. do they? Mm. No price at all. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I totally go with this. It does need to be stretched further for there to be more ebbs and flows in the context of that inning. Because yeah. otherwise, you know, you've got, te- you've got ten geezers in the hutch, yeah. or nine, nine, in, nine waiting to get in. and Eight and over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and even if you've got ten and over, then it's a doddle. Yeah. Twelve yeah. and over, it should yeah. be a doddle. And and you and you course and you've got no one has any way of knowing just at which point the five over thing is going to kick in. Do you? Mm. you don't know. Yeah, very, which very is true. which is why I wonder. And again, this I'm not saying that this is right, and I'm not making any excuses for what happened down at home. I'm, I'm really not. But I wonder whether the umpires kind of looked at it and went, you know what? I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure we can give one side or the other two points in this. Then under these circumstances, let's let's cull it before it happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Possibly. Um, how else to explain? Being one ball shy of a result, yeah. But then you, you can understand in, in the in. in it's the, not their place to do that as well. I have to. I have to say that you know, it isn't their place to kind of make a moral judgment. No, or not no, either. absolutely not. Um, but even if there were only a few hundred people in that in that ground, they'd have been, you know, pissed right through, been rained on for th- two or three hours. There'll be some some young young folk in there as well who are thinking, oh, what's this? What's all this about? Uh, 
And then you go home and you say, who won? Well, it was a draw. <laughs> what, what do you mean it was a draw? Well, they, they needed to bowl one, one more ball and then Team A would have won. But as it was, it was a draw. So, so, so they bowled 150-odd deliveries, but they couldn't bowl 151. And, people are th- and we're trying to sell the game. <laughs> we're trying to convince people this is the greatest game ever made. Yeah. Sometimes we definitely don't help, help ourselves. No, well, we do not. W- w- one thing that I was... I've not heard... I don't think I've heard anyone make this point, but looking at, looking at that, their five-over target was, was only 39, which is eight and over-ish, chasing a, a, a total where you needed basically nine and over to win. Mm. I wonder if DLS like properly takes into consideration power plays when you're supposed to be hitting. You know, that's the easiest time to bat. No, I don't know, but that, don't that's, know that's, entirely, that's entirely my point, isn't mm. it? You know, Sur- Surrey's innings was adjusted based on the amount of wickets they lost, yeah. batting first over a 20-over period. Yeah. Whereas the, and the adjustment is made for a team who have all ten wickets in in the hutch to bat for five overs. Mm. I mean, that's just that's just nonsense. Yeah, it, that's complete nonsense. Mm. No, I completely agree. Um, so there, there's the hundred wild card draft on Friday. Each side still has one player to pick. Um, do you want to pick out a few players that we should keep our eyes on, or you think might might get picked up? Yeah, I mean, one would be one you mentioned a bit earlier in this podcast, uh, who's Jordan Thompson, at Yorkshire pace bowling all rounder. Um, but he's really been giving it whack with the bat. I think 66 off 28 against Worcester at seven a week ago. Uh, and then he batted at three a few days ago and hit, you know, some, another half century. Yeah, in no time, five, yeah. whatever. 71 or some, something like that. Um, so he's one to look out for. Doesn't have a hundred contract. So um, there, Eskenazi is timing. The thing is, you want, it, you, don't, you want to be timing your run well. And Eskenazi is. He's had a seriously, staggeringly good week. And it's not a long tournament. The yeah. tournament doesn't start in a very long time either. So you, you want to be informed, actually, yeah. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's brains behind picking someone who's just yeah. in incredible nick at the moment. So, so another one would be Sam Hain, who started off the tournament really well, but then if you look at his last couple of innings, he's just got a duck and a two. Um, I mean, he will still be in the mix, but it's like you want to you want to come to Friday just having had a week like, like Eskenazi where you've you know reeled off a ton at Lords and, and had you know, hit yeah. a couple of match-winning half-centuries, basically. Um, another Yorkshireman I'd pick up, pick out is is Bess. Bess has had a really good blast, and he's not played a lot of white ball cricket, um, and he wasn't picked up. He's not got an England contract, so I think I think he'll be one of them. Um, Butch, anyone to pick out? Um, left arm spin, Moriarty. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm quite surprised he hasn't been picked up at all. Actually, so I, I suspect he 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 might. Uh, well, they will have a look at him. Um, whoever the coaches are. Uh, Conway and Decock signed up, though, for Southern yes, Brave. Yes, Did we discuss that last week? No, we didn't. No, no. We didn't. so this is, this is quite significant, I think, because this, this runs or fails, I think, on the, on the quality of the fair, but also the quality of the overseas as well. And to have those two, Decock and Conway, Conway might not be a household name yet, but he's a serious talent, as we know, and Decock is one of, the, one of the greats of the modern game. So to have those two signed up now is replacing... Uh, Stoinis and one other Australian. Who was it? Warner. Yeah, okay. Uh, who were not coming over for COVID reasons. Um, to have quality there, real quality. You know, we're not kind of grabbing them from from Division Two or Three here. You know, so so that's 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 a feather in the cap for the tournament. I'll give me in 2021. They're you know as good as picks as those two guys were in in 2019. Um, yeah, just 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 on the wild card. Uh, one player I've talked about before in the pod uh, who I think will get picked up. Jake Linter at, at Warwickshire or Birmingham. Yeah. Bears, left arm wrist spinner, one of few in the country. Uh, his economy rate in particular has been excellent in his in his season and a half uh, for Warwickshire in the Blast. So I think I think he'll get picked up as well. Um, but that's that's on Friday and should be quite interesting. Um, and elsewhere in the county game, there's a massive round of the championship starting this weekend. Um, by my maths, with one or two games to go, 13 out of the 18 counties still are in with a shot of qualifying for Division One, which is which is very exciting. We've discussed it before. I like, broadly supportive, I think, of the, the format. Looking at it now, after that first round has revolved, mm-hmm. a slight recalibration of the numbers, I reckon. Um, you know, Essex have played nine games, I think, now. I think one or two others have played nine as well, which means they've only got one game left. Uh, for me, probably seven and three, or even a six and a four, would maybe be a better reflection and it would also help the England test side as well because you'd have players who are playing four-day cricket in the build-up to the marquee series. As it stands, if you just take Lawrence as, as one who might get, get the gig, he's going to have two red ball innings in, in like the seven weeks from his final test match to 
in theory, the first yeah. test. <laughs> but you're making lots of yeah. noises. Yeah, yeah, well, only because I, I could not agree more. I mean, the idea that there, there are only, for most teams, there are only um, two matches of four-day cricket uh, or significant four-day cricket left. Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, there, there will be games played afterwards and, and Division One will be contested, et cetera, et cetera. And then there'll be sort of, um, sort of I don't know, benefit games is not quite right, but sort of, um, uh, pro, pro, not promotional, um, Games Tri- in trial-y, yeah. trial-y type game. Yeah. You know, well, a little bit like, no, I, I mean, you know, you can giggle about it, but they're a little bit like the matches that used to be when you got to the, you, you got to the last four or five rounds of the season when you had a, a one, a one division county championship, or maybe, you know, with five or six rounds left where, where teams would, would then, as a matter of course, would play younger up and coming players who perhaps weren't, wouldn't get a gig in their strongest 11, or you might, you know, retire off a couple of players early and get some of the young thrusters in. That used to happen as a matter of course in a one division championship and became more and more scarce as um, promotion and relegation sort of, um, you know, put the put the brakes on any of that type of experimentation. So that's the word I was looking for, experimental rounds um, in the other two divisions. Um, and so, you know, th- th- there, is some, there is some merit there and you might, you know, few stars of the future might appear where they might otherwise not have had a, had a gig um, in the old uh, in the old way of doing things. And you saw but that I, last I completely year. agree with Phil. I mean, se- seven and three, six and four. I mean, for for two reasons. One, obviously, that you you know the, there's going to be more four day cricket, meaningful four day cricket, and whilst the England are getting ready to pick their test teams, yes, um, more chances for 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 batters to get a chance of batting in better, slightly better or different conditions as the summer wears on. Um, and also because the bowlers were absolutely hanging, they played what some of them played nine matches in the space of in the space of less than two months um, at the beginning of the season, which none of which is good for the overall standard of the of the um, of the cricket. So, yeah, find a way, find a way of doing right, it, and, please. And, and last season, actually, you did see the benefit of games with the beginning of it, benefits of having games with not that much on them. You saw a lot of young players make their debuts who've gone on to have really good seasons this year. Um, Cool. El- elsewhere in in the international game, um, the ICC have announced, as expected, that the T20 World Cup will be held in the UAE and Oman um, and in the Caribbean at the moment. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week when the series is finished, but South Africa are currently 2-1 up against West Indies in West Indies in the Caribbean. Um, the third game is a bit of a thriller. South Africa won that by one run. Uh, to finish off the show, we've got a few questions from the listeners. Um Taha, Butch and Phil haven't actually seen them. This Fun. is your Fiona Bruce impression, isn't it? I like it. <laughs> um, question for you, Phil. Right. From the Ron Out blog. Yeah. Uh, directed to you, because I know you've talked about this before. This is a, this is a, a passion Maybe you should yours. direct it elsewhere um, then. The decline of the big-bottomed fast bowler has been fairly sharp. <laughs> is this the end, or is it more cyclical, and they'll come back sooner rather than later? Joffre is the only one I can really think of. Um, you know... Well, J- J- Joffre doesn't have a big bum. I was thinking that as well. I was thinking Joffre that as well. doesn't have... Yeah. I, I don't want to de- debate that too too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a marvellous question. I, I just have images of Matthew Hoggard running in at Sydney. <laughs> um, yeah, my word. There's always room for a nice big arse in cricket. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Excellent. Next. Well, well, well answered, well answered. But sh- Richard asks... So we get, we, we when, when overrated talked about a lot, I think I'm definitely guilty. Um, I'm not sure this is a bad thing to be guilty of, of not really uh, paying much attention to that debate because I think it can be quite tiresome mm. and I don't really care that much. But, but people do care. Uh, and Richard is one of those people who does care. Um, the only Bruce would never do it like this. <laughs> he asked, why do umpires not enforce overrates in professional cricket? Uh, we do it in the recreational game. Why are fans regularly short changed by seeing fewer over, fewer overs than they paid for when and how will this change that's a good question it's a, it's a fair point it's a, it fair, point. a fair point um the umpire the umpires have limited powers to do anything about it they can chivy the uh, the captains along and they can there can be fines which i think are useless in all forms of cricket actually because the only re- the only way to get people to do what you want them to do is to is to penalise them in the match that they're playing in, not financially. Some point down the line, when they probably won't even notice it's come out of their bank account. Um, the uh, I would I would argue slightly that in a if you buy a ticket for a fifty over match or a twenty over match, you're expecting the amount of overs in a in a four day or a test match game. You're not paying for overs. You're paying for the day day of the game day's cricket. 
um, you know, as evidenced by the fact that you could buy a ticket for the last day of the game, which might be discounted, and it could be over before after lunchtime. You've, you've got a result, but you're not getting the overs. So uh, the, the frustration I can, I can totally understand. One of the things that I think is mitigating in all of this that gets so easily overlooked by commentators and by fans alike is, is this. That even though over rates have been slow historically, the West Indies, of course, would, would, were famous for getting down to 11 overs an hour. And, and Clive Lloyd's answer to that was always, well, we've just beaten you in two and a half days, you know. <laughs> we're actually early. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, is, is this. And on a normal test match day, whereby if you took, if there were 10 wickets taken, right, every wicket you're supposed to get two minutes added on. So if, so let's say, for example, you've got, a, the day is six hours, Two, 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 three two-hour sessions, and you take 10 wickets, you've got another 20 minutes of play has, has been removed, right? So that takes you up to six hours 20. Then if you get a change of innings, that's another 10 minutes, which takes you up to six and a half hours. So there you go. There's just That's why half past six is the kind of like the cutoff point. It gives you the chance to take all the wickets and have, an, and have a cha- change of innings. Add to that, every single time there's a DRS review, review Drinks breaks that happen on the hour, every hour of, of every session. Um, various, whatever the other stoppages might be. And people will say, oh, you know, players running drinks on and off. That, that very rarely ever causes any time to be lost. And, you know, the 12th men are on and off with a flash before the ball gets bowled. Um, captains perhaps taking a little bit of time to, to set a field or whatever. The, 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 the DRS reviews alone knock out 15 minutes a day of your play. At least. And so yeah. 15 minutes when you're not playing counts for what we're talking four overs four overs just gone just like that and there's no way of putting that time back into the game so even even when we were in Sri Lanka um, which I, I believe I may have mentioned already in, in the pod um, and spin was being bowled nearly for the whole time because of because of those things because of things like DRS which didn't exist before even bowling spin nearly all day we didn't finish at six o'clock on or five o'clock on the on the dot you were always needed to go into the extra extra um, half an hour to get your overs in so there are there are lots of things at play here. You you could say, of course, well, why don't we? Why don't you just elongate the day? Why right. don't you just go? Okay, yeah. we're going to start at half past ten, and the uh, and the official close of play time is going to be half past six, and then if we need to go on till seven, mm. we go on till seven. Yeah, okay, you could do that. If you've got the light, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. Um, the one th- one thing I would say is is that the. Cricket teams, I mean, what it would do, it would force cricket teams not to go in with only four bowlers and things like that. You could find yourselves with some very, very long sessions out there in the field, which would be, which would hurt you in terms of trying to keep control of a game. And maybe that's not a bad thing either. I don't know. Um, but that's the, that's the only way to do it. The only way to do it, I think, in the modern era, particularly for test match cricket, is to actually, is to add another hour of actual playing time. Players aren't going to be happy with that. You add on 20 minutes per session, maybe. And there you go, and there you, and you've done it, and then they will still find a way of being slower than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's um, and I think I think it's a very fair point that fifteen overs an hour in the modern game, with all the gizmos, all the mm. all the stoppages, uh, is a is a tough ask. But, I think I think that's a fair point. But I think in, it, it, but it, sorry, go on. But starting the game at this kind of demure time of eleven o'clock. Because it might do a bit too much, and 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 we need to get in our seats, you know, after having a nice breakfast and a coffee and so on. That to me is is, is ludicrous. Yeah. The the Ashes 05 started at half ten, and that went okay from what I remember. Uh, the players might kick up a stink, but if we are committed to ninety overs a day, and if that is the the figure that mm. we think I mean, needs play- needs to be had to, to, for a four hundred and fifty over test match. The players don't mind. I mean, you know, as a player, I quite like starting at half past ten. You get to the ground that little bit early. You get half past ten. You'd leave earlier. You'd have you'd have more night time. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> there was no, no issue with that. More hangover time. No, no issue with that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, you start in India. The, the, the yes, yeah, so nine half o'clock nine. in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so you, you're back at the hotel by half past four. I mean, I've never really understood the eleven o'clock start. I mean, why is that? Is it? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's historically, it's, it's, yeah. the, it's, it's the, the classy time yeah. to start. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, amateur day. Look, oh, my six, dear old boy, I wouldn't be starting before 11. Six, six, hours, six hours of official playing time is not enough to get 90 overs a day. Right. And so you either, you either make it so that it's an 80 over day, which I don't think would be satisfactory, or you, or you add another half an hour of, of, of playing time plus the extra half an hour to get the rest of the overs in, which might concentrate a few minds in terms of getting through the overs a bit more. But I still think 
that you're really struggling because of the because of the time that gets knocked out of a day's play by by means that are not the player's fault. Yeah, that's a big that's an issue that isn't, the game hasn't had to encounter before. But no extra time has been found in order to to offset it. No, hundred percent. Final thing I'll say on this is. Uh, the final thing I'll say on this is that um, I think players are held to a un- completely unrealistic standard. Like if you look at the ICC's own, ICC's own regulations, it says 15 overs an hour, but it takes out five minutes, which is an over at least for the drinks break. So that's already 14. And then wickets are accounted for, DRS accounted for. It's actually pretty rare that teams get done for slow over eights. And there has to be about 11 or 12 because, overs because now to a, be get done, done for it. You make a very good point. So a lot of people may not realise this either. So if you start off on the hour, you're supposed to get 15 overs in, right? If you take a wicket in that, you lose two minutes, okay? So you take two wickets, four minutes, that's, an o- that's one over gone. So you're down to 14, right? And that's, and that's all it takes. As soon as you start to, as soon as you lose time, the time is allowed for four things like wickets, four things like drinks breaks. And so all of this time is actually being eroded from the playing time without you actually, without the spectators knowing it's even happening. And so more often than not, the play, you might get to the end of the day's play with a, with a, and finish at half past six. So you've taken up the extra half an hour that's been allotted to, to get the rest of the overs in. You still might be short on the overs. But when the umpires make their calculations, you're still not behind on time. You're still, you've, you're still up with the required over rate because of the allowances you get for DRS, wickets, change of innings. All of these things come off the time. Yeah, and, and going back to the question, the question is that how can you actually change it? Um, teams now get punished more I think than they did before yet points penalties in competitions that really matter Um, so hopefully we've answered that one couple of questions to finish Uh, Taha Tom asks what is cricket's equivalent of the one-sided England-Germany rivalry Uh, Tom asked that question before the game yesterday forgive me Butch but you know England-Australia 90s (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah not wrong (laughs) in India India Pakistan in ICC tournaments. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> apart from, um, I just shouldn't say this out loud, should I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, apart from the Champions Trophy, the great <laughs> Champions Trophy 2017 game where Pakistan absolutely thrashed India. Well, you could just say World over. Cups. Sorry? You could just say World Cups. Yeah, all right. Let's yeah, go with World yeah. Cups. Let's yeah. go with World Cups. Well, well okay. answered. Well answered. Uh, and finally, um, let's go to Phil for this. Uh, Siddharth asks Can you suggest some good cricket books, past and present? especially some county specials or obscure stuff the fans aren't familiar with? It's a great question. Um, uh, c- county books, great county books. Well, firstly, there is uh, Stephen Chalk's magnum opus uh, called Summer's Crown, The History of the County Championship. Stephen Chalk is a, is, is a, is a, is a giant of cricket writing. Um, and he's quite small actually but he's, he's absolutely <laughs> marvelous cricket writer uh, he's got great heart great soul great feel for the game and he's put together the definitive story it's a bit like a coffee coffee table book so i'd recommend that about county cricket um sometimes uh well sometimes i forgot to laugh by peter roebuck who always kind of sort of skewered the club ability of county cricket was a, was a man uh slightly out of out of pace with the rest of it um, he wrote a couple of books on county cricket as well. Uh, Praying for Rain was another one, so you get the kind of theme. <laughs> um, a Lot of Hard Yakka by Simon Hughes, um, not of this parish, but of a, of a similar parish to us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a classic book of its time. Um, so, yeah, plen- plenty around county cricket. Uh, there's, there's some really good sort of club histories as well. Andrew Colomossi, who is the son, uh, the father of Tom Col- Colomossi, is the, who writes for the Evening Standard. He did a really, really good history of, social history of Yorkshire cricket going back through the decades. That's a, I'd recommend that. But yeah, pl- plenty of county cricket-wise. Just more generally, my all-time favourite cricket book is Golden Boy from Christian Ryan, the Australian writer. Um, Golden Boy and the Bad Old Days of Australian Cricket. Have you read that, Mark? No. Oh, you'd like it. You'd like it. So it's set. It's set during that era, the furry-bellied medallion era of Lily <laughs> Marsh Chapel, uh, and Kim Hughes is this sort of ethereal batsman who only wanted to entertain. That was his only reason for playing the game. And of course, when you got blonde curly locks and you're three years younger than Lily, and you grew up in Western Australia around the corner from Lily, and Lily is obviously the alpha's alpha, and then you have this this sort of flighty stroke maker who just wanted to entertain 
there was a lot of tension between those two. Now, famously, Kim Hughes was ended up captaining Australia, the youngest Australian captain at, of all time at that point. I think he was 23. And he ran that tour, the 81 tour, when Lillian Marsh were recalled to it um, just a year or two after World Series cricket. That Kim Hughes had stepped away from, didn't wasn't a part of it, to stay loyal to the, the baggy green. And it's the story of that era in Australian cricket, but it's the story of men, it's the story of dressing rooms, it's the story of fragile egos, and it's also the story, literally, of Dennis Lilly and Kim Hughes fighting in a street, not dissimilar to this, in West London, and ending up staggering back to their hotel room in nothing but a pair of pants <laughs> uh, the most perfect sort of metaphor for that time oh, a great book that sounds it really yeah. is and the thing is no one would talk kim hughes wouldn't talk to him christian ryan so it's a biography of kim hughes to, talking to other people but it's a it's more a tale of the time really i think you sold that pretty well yeah it's, it's a it, good the good Mar- marungu by alan butcher yes is a good the great, the tale, great of, tale of Zim- zimbabwe and cricket in the last century that is sure. genuinely that is yeah. a, cla- a real cracker so that's obviously his dad uh, a couple of years out there and so on that that made our short list actually when we got a few wisdom heads together yeah. uh, and we picked out christian ryan's book as the winner in the end yeah um, can i throw in a yeah. obscure one uh ed cowan did a book about 10 11 years ago it was basically a season of life in the sheffield shield uh, that's quite obscure but quite quite a nice read as well oh, before before he played for australia as well oh yeah. that is interesting um, and, and Phil, there's going to be a book about Essex, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Let's, let's reserve judgment on that one <laughs> until I've written a few words of it. Yeah. We've got that to look forward to. <laughs> anyway, yeah, right. sorry we didn't get to round to on, answering everyone's questions, but thanks for those. Um, cheers, Butch. Cheers, Tom. Cheers, Phil. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, tell your friends, leave us a fine review, and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.